church, let's go ahead and uh, turn in our Bibles to John chapter 18. And this morning, as I mentioned last week, kind of split John 18 into two, uh, covering two topics. Last week we covered the uh, account of Christ appearing before the Jewish council. And now we get to cover uh, Peter's denial in that same chapter. Now, before we get to our text, let me begin by asking the following question. Is there a greater sin than denying Jesus Christ? Is there a greater sin than that? Well, if you think about it, the only reason why anyone would end up in hell and eternal judgment is because of that very thing. They, at what point in their life, rejected Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 33, Jesus says, But whoever denies me before men... I will deny, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. To deny Jesus is a grave offense, a grave sin. Now in the text that we have before us, we are going to see that the Apostle Peter not only denied Jesus once, but he denied him three times. So according to Matthew 10, 33, then, does this mean that Jesus has denied Peter before God the Father, which is tantamount to being condemned? Well, if you were to ask New Testament scholar Robert Gundry, he would tell you that this, in fact, is the case, according to to his understanding of Matthew chapter 26, verse 75, which reads, And Peter, remember the word which Jesus has said before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he, being Peter, went out and wept bitterly. Back in uh, October of 2014, uh, being the hopeless romantic that I am, I took my beloved wife on a date to hear Dr. Gundry present a lecture at uh, Westmont College, right there, beautifully located, just blocks from the Pacific Ocean, up on Highway 1 or uh, Highway 101. Westmont advertised that Dr. Gundry would be presenting a lecture entitled, Peter, False Disciple and Apostate According to St. Matthew. Now, I was intrigued when I saw that because at that very time, I was in uh, my advanced Greek class and my Greek professor, one of his passions is to defend the inerrancy of the Word of God and a lot of his courses, uh, through a lot of his courses, um, he would bring up uh, scholars um, whom had rejected inerrancy, uh, Robert Gundry being one of them. For, uh, for example, in, I think in the mid-90s, Robert Gundry um, was, I think, politely asked <laughs> to leave the Evangelical Theological Society. I think he was kicked out uh, because of his denial of inerrancy as understood by the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy. And you can't deny inerrancy and not begin to, to sway on the meaning of Scripture. Well, anyway, again, being the hopeless romantic that I am, I took my beloved to see to hear Dr. Gundry speak at um, Westmont. Now, what's interesting, not only did I take her out on a date, I mean, we did eat before we went to listen to Dr. Gundry, but I went kind of like on a spy mission. 
Not officially, but kind of, on behalf of my Greek professor. So we get there, and we actually met Dr. Grundry walking to the, to the uh, lecture hall there at Westmont, beautiful campus. Um, he actually attended uh, LA Baptist College, which is now the Master's University. Well, Master's College and now Master's University. He actually did his undergrad there, and we started to talk. I told him that I, was, I graduated from there, but both Don and I graduated from there, and that I was a student at the seminary. And he goes, oh, yes, I, you know, I, I, I went to that school before it was a master's. So we just had a great talk on the way there. Well, anyway, we sat in the second row, and we had a recording device ready because I knew that Dr. Farnell would definitely want a copy uh, of this. In fact, Dr. Farnell probably was one of the most uh, prominent New Testament scholars that actually responded to this lecture uh, a couple of days after he, Dr. Gundry gave this lecture. Well, anyway, here's Gundry's premise. You ready for this? Gundry says, unlike the other Gospels, Matthew does not include an account of Peter's restoration. After denying Jesus, Peter simply, quote, went out and wept bitterly, according to Matthew chapter 26, verse 75, the verse that I just read to you. And his weeping looks more like despair than repentance. Thus, Peter fits Matthew's criteria of false disciple and apostates and shares the same status of that of Judas. So according to Dr. Gundry's understanding of Matthew 26.75, Peter was an apostate. Why? Because to deny Christ is a grave offense. And he describes this weeping, uh, the, when we, uh, the, the weeping out, uh, going, going out and they're weeping bitterly as that which is experienced by those who are weeping and, and gnashing their teeth in hell. Now, I, I, must, I must say that I, I was lost probably within the first 30 minutes of the lecture. I had no idea. I'm just glad I was recording it because I just could not follow um, his, this premise. So now I went back to see if I could find the video of this lecture on Westmont's college website, but uh, when you click the video, it's no longer available. I don't know what happened. Um, now, he did go and write a book based on this lecture um, back in 2015. And then there's a second edition that came out, published in 2018, where Gundry responds to, re to the reviews of his book. So the book is Peter, a false disciple and apostate, according to St. Matthew. Um, so what do we do with Peter's blatant denial of Christ? Do we agree with Gundry? who thinks that he is an apostate, a false disciple, an apostate, because of his denial. Surely, such sin warrants God's strongest condemnation. We would definitely agree. Yet let me ask you this, beloved, which sin doesn't warrant God's condemnation? So if you're there in John chapter 18, let's go ahead and read our text for this morning. And then we'll ask our Lord to guide us in our study. Beginning in verse 15, the apostle John gives us an account, his account, of Simon Peter's denial. By saying Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple, now, that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slave and the officers were standing there having made a charcoal fire for it was cold and they were warning them themselves and Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. Now let's go ahead and jump down to verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself so they said to him, 
You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear, who, whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word, and we just thank you for this portion where we are reminded of Peter's humanity and fallibility. which points to even our own sinfulness, fallibility, or wretchedness. Father, we do thank you for your word and ask that you would guide us in the study of it, that we may know what you want us to know today. Not only that we may know it, but that we may know it so that we could put it into practice. So again, Father, we ask that you go before us now in Jesus' name. Amen. It is very difficult to read this account, isn't it, beloved, as we just imagine. There could not have been a worse time to deny Jesus than that. As a follower of Jesus, one cannot fathom ever denying him. Yet, Peter did. Now, although we can't get into Peter's head, we can't get into his mind. We don't really know why he did it. What, what led him to do that in his mind? But what we can do is look to God's word and see what may have led him to do that. So this morning, we will look at three main reasons that led to Peter's denial using not only our text in John, but also looking at the other gospel accounts. So We're going to have somewhat of a topical lesson, if you will, even though we're going to be going through the text. But I think it's important to get to dig into a little bit of to the other accounts as well, so we can uh, get information from the other gospel writers whom all speak of this, obviously, because it was a very big deal. Now, the first reason that I like to suggest to you, beloved, for why, what led Peter to do this, the first reason, and I would say the biggest reason for Peter's denial of Christ, I would say to you that it is, it is Peter's overconfidence. It is Peter's overconfidence. Now, there is no doubt that Peter was preeminent among the disciples. As Hughes comments, no disciple spoke as often as, no, as Peter. Peter speaks a lot, as recorded in all the Gospels. Our Lord addressed him more than any other of his followers. No disciple was reproved by Jesus as much and as strongly as Peter was. He was also the only disciple who thought it is duty to reprove Jesus. He was impulsive, and one of those souls who acted first and thought afterward. No disciple ever so boldly confessed and encouraged Christ. But on the other side, no one ever bothered the Lord more than Peter did. All the Gospels testify of Peter's primacy. Peter was always talking. And what he said ranged from the most incredible things to the most ridiculous things. Of Peter, Lloyd Douglas in his book, The Big Fisherman says he was a headstrong, unbridled hulk who was always getting into all kinds of trouble, causing his master plenty of the same. But, Douglas notes, Peter kept turning back. To Christ. Now, of this Peter, John says in verse 15 in our text, he was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. This other disciple, unnamed disciple, 
most scholars believe to be the Apostle John, given that he, even in his gospel, uh, remains unnamed. There's been some doubt on that, but most scholars believe that it to be John, the author of this book. Now, that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside, so the disciple, presumably John, who was known to the high priest, in fact, it, it, is, it is thought by some that John may have been, even been related uh, to the high priest. Known, they were kin even by some degree, John, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. So clearly the doorkeeper knew that John had walked in with Jesus and that this other guy was walking along with Jesus, but John was given entrance, but not this other guy until John basically told the doorkeeper, in essence, he's with me. Let him in. Now, a couple of questions. I think not only entered my mind, but probably yours as well. Why did Peter follow? Why did he follow? Well, listen to what it says in Matthew 26, 58. It says, but Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. So Matthew gives us a little insight to that question. Why did Peter follow? Was it curiosity? He wanted to see what the outcome was going to be. What did Peter think he was going to accomplish by following John and Jesus to the courtyard? I think that would be even a fair question even of the Apostle John. But we're not talking about him, we're talking about Peter. Was he there to defend his friend and savior? Or was he simply curious? Or perhaps he didn't want to be proven wrong. Please turn to John 13, verse 13. Perhaps Peter did not want to be proven wrong. Notice what it says in John chapter 13, verses 3 and onward. Actually, it's 30, verse 30 to 33, not 3. I forgot a 3 there. That is what he says. So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him and in himself, and he will glorify himself immediately. Little children, he says, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Look at verse 36 now. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot come. You cannot follow me now, but you will follow me. Later, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Could it be that Peter followed? because he did not want to be proven wrong. Now turn to Mark chapter 14, verse 27. Mark 14, verse 27. And we'll read to verse 31. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because it is written, 
I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, here's Peter again, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows twice, you will sh you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all were saying the same thing also. So Peter might have voiced it, but according to Mark, they were all the rest of the disciples were also thinking it. So instead of pleading with Christ, crying out, Lord, say it isn't so. Please, Lord, keep me from ever denying you. Peter, albeit from a loving heart, speaks boastfully. And that's why I said that perhaps one of the reasons, the primary reason, for Peter's denial of Christ, it was his overconfidence. He thought too much of his own will and power. He thought he could handle it. He thought he would be strong when the time would come. Instead of listening to what Jesus was saying and pleading, Lord, let it not be so. Help me for, for when that time comes. So here we have a very important lesson, beloved, that comes out of Proverbs 16, verse 18, which many of you probably know by heart. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit or haughty spirit before stumbling. Peter exemplifies this perfectly. He thought too much of himself. He thought too much of his ability. Now, second reason for Peter's denial, I will say to you, is prayerlessness. Although not explicitly in the text, Peter's prayerlessness is an issue here. Since we're in Mark, hopefully you're still there. Look at verse four, Mark 14. Look at verse 32 through 38. This is before the rejection, denial. Then they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John. Remember, Peter's primacy among even, even uh, pre preeminence, even amongst the disciples. Okay. He took Peter, James, and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, to Peter, James, and John. My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray if it was possible that the hour might pass from pass by. And, he, and as he was saying, Abba, Father, all things have possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch one hour for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed to the hands of sinners. So Peter, James, and John were asked to pray, to intercede, to remain vigilant, watchful. Not, I would say, simply watchful over Christ, but over their own hearts, over their own flesh. Luke records Jesus warning his men twice. 
in Luke chapter 22, verses 40 and 46, saying, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Verse 46 of Luke 22. Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. They were warned. Peter's lack of vigilance in prayer was a cause, not the cause, but I would suggest to you, a cause for his falling into temptation. And hear this, let us heed, heed Peter's own words later on in 1 Peter chapter 5, 8, where he says, be sober, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seek, seeking someone to devour. Who do you think knew this firsthand? This is a very much mature apostle Peter now. Towards the end of his apostolic career, who to the church reminds them, be sober, be diligent, be on the alert. Because the adversary, because the devil is prowling around seeking to devour you. Peter experienced this very thing. You know, we're also reminded of what Jesus told Peter as recorded in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, where it says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Jesus says, that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Could Jesus have had Peter's denial in mind? I think so. Jesus knew that Satan had it out for Peter. I say strong, but somewhat boastful leader who would lead this group. If you get rid of Peter, that would be pretty good, if Satan could. But it's interesting because it reminds us of something here, beloved. Peter's temptation, Peter's testing was known to God, and I will suggest to you was allowed by God. Now, we know that God could never tempt us, would never tempt us into sinning. But we are tested all the time. If God gave the devil permission to do all that he did to Job, if God gave permission to Satan to do what he did with Peter, to test him that way, who do you think we are that we that he that God would not allow the enemy to test us, to tempt us? Now, but something very important though is notice this. Yes, Satan had demanded permission. Demanded what? A, that's amazing. Satan had demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But get this. But Jesus says, "I have prayed for you." Note that. Jesus didn't pray that the trial would not come, but that Peter would not give in to temptation, but he actually did. But yet, if we understand that Jesus prayed for Peter, Jesus' prayer would not return void. Peter, I would suggest to you, was therefore protected, ultimately. So I'm going to ask you, what? would keep God from allowing the same in our lives. I don't think we ought to think that we are any better or that we deserve any, any, any less. And that's why prayer is so important, beloved, because prayer keeps us village, vigilant, alert, and powered up when Satan's attacks come. When we are the most weak, we know that Satan will attack. Prayerlessness uh, could land us in a world of hurt because one who is praying is one who receives power. Prayerlessness equals weakness. 
That's why we are instructed to always be praying. Pray always. Be diligent. So self-confidence and second, prayerlessness, I suggest are two of the primary reasons why Peter fell in denying his Savior. And this leads to his first denial, according to our text, back in John 18, verse 17. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of these disciples, one of this man's disciples, are you? And he simply answered, I am not. Now the grammar of the servant girl's a question asked here calls for a, a no answer. It expects a no answer, which Peter easily gave. Now, sadly, the, the I am not answer just naturally flowed out of Peter's mouth. He didn't even think twice. Someone's like, you, sh you surely can't be one of these guys' disciples, right? Oh, no, I'm not. Just, just came out. Now, this leads us to the third reason for Peter's denial. And I will suggest to you that that is the influence of the world. Notice verse 18. Now the slave and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold, and they were warming themselves. Now, John is the only one who gives us this much detail as to a, a charcoal fire. It was cold, and they were warming themselves. And notice, and Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. So they were in the courtyard, a, of, a, of a private residence, but the courtyard. It was cold, um, and people were naturally warming themselves, and Peter, wanting to warm himself, went and stayed with our Savior's enemies, really. Now jump down to verse 25, where John continues the story. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so this said to him, you are not also one of the, his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. Now, loved ones, Peter most assuredly felt the pressure of being around these people. Surely there was conversation. And what else are you going to be talking about? They were probably talking about what was going on, the proceedings. Could the conversation be going something like this? Well, I'm so glad that crazy man was finally caught and arrested. I can't wait to get I can't wait for us to get rid of this guy and his followers. And here's Peter doing his very best to keep silent. Now we know that his denials increased in emphasis according to the other gospel writers. So whereas the first denial was a simple no, I don't know him. We see that the last denial was a curse-filled outburst, according to Mark chapter 15, verse 71, which was typical of the sentiments of Jesus' enemies. To what degree was Peter influenced by the enemies of Christ? We do not know. But I think it serves also as a good lesson for us this morning, that you cannot be around the world and not be influenced by the world. And I don't know why he went in there. Curiosity? Was he ready to defend? He didn't. Neither defend John or, or, or Jesus. Do you want to prove Jesus wrong? He said, I'm going to stand by you. He was overconfident. He didn't pray. He wasn't prayed up. He fell asleep. And now he's standing next to Peter's, uh, Jesus' enemies, listening, probably doing his very best not to engage in conversation. But even that pointed him out. Was he afraid for himself, for his life? Possibly. But again, the point that I'm trying to make here is that's a potential reason for why he also denied him, even the second and third time, is because of the pressure of the people around him. He felt the need to deny Christ again. Peter was affected by his association with those not walking with Christ. And isn't it true, beloved, that even for most of us, 
I don't know about you, but I can't be with the world a lot. We're of the world. We're in the world, but not of the world. And yes, it is true. We cannot shun the world completely. But at some point, there's just so much of the world that I can, can take. And that's why church is important. And being with church family is important because out in the world is, is, is horrible. And even, and I would say, those in our younger years are more prone to be affected by the world. Where, yes, we can make a proclamation of knowing Jesus Christ, but the more we are with the world, we tend to, to go with the flow. And we, not, we do not like to admit that that often happens. When we often laugh at off-color jokes, when we often uh, say things or see things or do things simply because we feel the, the pressure I know I fall in prey to that, even within, uh, be, even within um, just uh, times when I'm with unsaved family. So it's 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 easy to be influenced uh, by by the world, as I suggest to you. Peter may have been, as he was warming himself with the enemies of Christ there in the courtyard. And again, it is amazing how much influence the world has on even, the, even Christians, even solid ones sometimes. Now for Peter, this culminated in his third rejection. Notice verse 26 and 27. One of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately the rooster crowed. Now, John apparently is very matter-of-fact here when it comes to Peter's denial. Very little uh, detailed with the, except, with the exception of the, um, uh, him not being known by the servant girl who was a doorkeeper. But here, John doesn't tell us what the outcome was. He doesn't tell us that Peter wept bitterly. He doesn't tell us anything. For example, in Matthew's account, and we read this, in Matthew 26, verse, uh, verse 26, verse 75, and Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said to him, before rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And then he went out and wept bitterly. Matthew gives us basically the result of such denial. In Mark's account, we read, Immediately the rooster, the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times, and he began to weep. In Luke's account, we read in Luke chapter 22, verses 60 and 62, but Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. Immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word, the Lord, the word of the Lord, how he has said to him, Before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Can you imagine? We were talking about irony last week. And irony does not escape even our topic today. So here Jesus is inside this illegal tribunal, sticking up for his men, not giving them away. And just outside in the courtyard, one of his very own is denying him. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine what that gaze felt like? Amen. He turned and looked at Peter. And then the rooster, I mean, the rooster crowed. He looked at Peter and he went out and wept bitterly. Now, John is the only one who does not record Peter's sorrow at the end of his denial account. He doesn't. It was just very matter of factly. But you know what John does record? Are you ready for this? Turn to John chapter 21. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, John does not record Peter's sorrow at the end of his denial account, but the thing that John does record that the others do not is this. Notice verse 15. Jesus has, resurrect, has resurrected. This is before his ascension. So when Jesus, so when they had, correction, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to them again a second time, to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Why was Peter grieved? Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Isn't that incredible? Three denials. And here Jesus restores him three times. Dr. Gundry, really? Peter, an apostate? <laughs> A false disciple? Look at verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, he's speaking to Peter, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now he said, signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he has spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Do you know what the first words were to Peter when, he, when Jesus called him? That stinky, rough, foul-mouthed fisherman. He said, follow me. And here, after his restoration, he just says to Peter, follow me. John's the only one who records that. So let me conclude with this. Is denying Christ a grave sin? 100%. Absolutely. In fact, that is what will land sinners in hell is the outright denial and rejection of Christ. But not even that sin is beyond God's forgiveness. But yet, here, a couple of lessons as we look at what Peter went through and what we can learn from this lesson. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, when he says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands, take heed that he does not fall. What an important reminder. Peter was overconfident. Peter was overconfident. And he fell big. I mean, there's no bigger sin than that. So let us learn from that. Let us who think we can stand strong, take heed, because we can fall very easily. But when we do, and just like Peter did, what do you do? What was Peter's going out there and weeping bitterly signify or point to? I would suggest to you, beloved, it was tremendous remorse and regret and hatred over his own sin. And as I mentioned before in the introduction, 
Peter, as a scoundrel that he was, he kept on coming back to Jesus. He kept on returning to Jesus. That's what separated him from Judas. So what do you do? Well, you repent. That's what you do. And you run back to Jesus. That's what you do. Remembering this, beloved, it is not how you start, but how you finish. And as Bag says, with God, failure is never final. Failure is never final with God. As born-again believers in Christ, even the greatest sin you have ever committed will not ultimately define you. And beloved, if I were to take a survey, which I would never dare to, there's probably some big sins that we've committed. But not even the biggest, worst sin that you've committed will ultimately define you as a born-again believer. For Jesus atoned for that sin on the cross, just as Jesus atoned for Peter's denial shortly after Peter denied him, just a few hours later. So the question begs to be answered, asked, do you know Jesus? I hope you do. I hope that he is your Lord and Savior. I hope that you've repented of your sins and trusted in him as Savior and Lord, knowing that even your worst sin will not ultimately define you. What will ultimately define you is Christ's atonement for you. You perhaps have made some horrible choices in your life, sinful choices, but isn't it great news to know that not, not even the worst of your choice will ultimately define you. On the other hand, there's a choice that will ultimately define you. And that is a choice that you didn't make. The choice that will ultimately define you is God's choice of you before the foundations of the earth. Do you know Jesus? I hope you do. Let us pray and prepare our heart to receive the Lord's table. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this morning and ask that you would remind us, Lord, even as we covered a small lesson on Peter. Lord, we are not any better than Peter, not by a long shot. In fact, many of us identify with Peter more than we care to admit. But like Peter, when confronted with our horrible sin, those of us who are yours, as painful as it may sometimes be, we run to you in repentance, in agony over our denial of you, which in fact happens every time we sin. Lord, we are not worthy of your atonement. We are not worthy of your love. And that's why we just rejoice in the truth of your word, which tells us that in you we are new creations, that in, we, that in you we are kept, that in you not even our worst sin could ever separate us from spending eternity with you.